Hi everyone, if you've been following along on the channel, you've learned how conditions here in America are likely to change by 2050. And within those changes, we found a lot of reasons for hope. When we take a calm, realistic look at what climate change is going to do to the places we love, we find that the future is not going up in flames. There are places that will fare poorly, there are places that won't change too much, and there are places where the changes to come will bring opportunities. In this video, we're going to take a look at the global context for our American forecast. You're going to see the outlook for our part of North America. It's just really great compared to much of the world. And that should inspire us to action and help us put the news into context. Because there are places where the future looks grim. And the more we prepare for our climate future, the more we'll be able to help. So to get started, let's get oriented. Let's look at a map of the world here and kind of divide it into broad climate zones. We've got Arctic, Antarctic, temperate, subtropical, and tropical. I realize this is simplifying, but let's all get on the same page. Keep it simple. You may have noticed that there's kind of a line in the US forecasts when we go through state by state where things get to be generally good. And that's around here, around the 42nd parallel. This line goes all the way around the world. And you can see over across the Atlantic, that's where you get to the parts of Europe with a decent climate outlook, is kind of by that line. Let's go down to the bottom of the world too. Down south, below that corresponding line, just the way the world is organized, you got less land mass. But you see some other places in that southern temperate zone with good outlooks, most notably New Zealand, which is a fantastic climate refuge that is highly aware of its status. That temperate zone, this zone has the best climate outlooks. Some people talk about opportunities presented by the Arctic, and there is increasing investment in Alaska, but the rate of change, it's too high for my tastes. I mean, we're talking complete transformations. In the temperate zones, the rate of change is more manageable. We'll be the most able to use our existing infrastructure, and we'll be able to live the most like we live today. You can see the rest of the world, both the tropical and subtropical zones, they're in a broad band that is facing more serious impacts. If we can hit RCP 4.5, we reduce catastrophic threats to these large bands. If we can hit 4.5, we can save more people in the subtropical band. These areas, the heat will become more like it is in the tropical band today. If we can hit 4.5, the people who live in this tropical band, this equatorial band, there we are still seeing severe collapse of ecosystems, of staple crops. It's very bad here. But remember, we often see on the news this idea that it's going to be like on fire everywhere. We need to remember they say that to scare us. Taking a calm, realistic look, there are regions that are looking at very severe impacts, and there are many other regions where we can prepare. There are even some regions like the Northern Great Plains and the Western Great Lakes where we can anticipate a future of growth and prosperity. Let's talk about the subtropical zones and the challenges they're facing, writ broad. Think of the tropical heat, like I mentioned, migrating up and down to the subtropical regions. But you know, when we think of tropical conditions, equatorial conditions, we tend to think of them as being fairly lush, as being kind of wet conditions. But this is not so much the expectation of climate scientists. Just because there is an equivalent temperature, that doesn't mean there's an equivalent climate in two places, right? There's a growing body of research, growing observational evidence that the water cycle is pushing more water towards temperate regions and less to these subtropical regions. The subtropical regions are getting drier faster than we anticipated. So the threat of, say, desertification, which has been a big challenge in North Africa, right? It's getting worse. It's the other hand, the counterbalance of the heavy rains we've been getting in the temperate regions, which you might have felt this past spring in the U.S. Thinking about these water challenges in the subtropical band, I think many of us have an ability to make a connection based on footage we've seen in the news. In the U.S., there has been good news coverage of water and climate in Europe. We saw this year major problems with the rivers of southern Europe. Many of us have seen the rivers in Italy and southern France this year that they have been disturbingly low for very long periods of time. Speaking of Europe in general, when I looked at 2050 overview information for Europe, it, it is very frightening. And you know, I'm, I'm pretty level-headed about all of this. When I say the European outlook is frightening, please remember, I'm pretty chill about the outlook for the U.S. 
Their outlook is very different, a whole different level of difficulty. People in Italy, Greece, and Portugal, it, it's pretty rough. All around the Mediterranean, as we get into that subtropical band, we're looking at a future that will not support current agriculture, a near future. The Middle East and North Africa, because of the loss of rain projected in these drying subtropical bands, the movement of water to the temperate band, particularly in spring, we're looking at very serious problems with dry heat in the Middle East and North Africa. Not only North Africa, but also South Africa have been highlighted by the OECD as regions of very high water stress by 2050. You may have seen reporting about that, about increasing difficulties with water access in South Africa, serious city level challenges. These subtropical water stress issues, they're also true for Asia. South and Central Asia are also on the OECD kind of red alert list for water stress. And that should be very alarming for everyone to hear because that's where so many people live. I mean, think about being human as a video game. Your most likely spawn points, they're in India and China. There are tons of us there. And both of these countries are looking at famine by 2050. The World Bank says so. World Bank analysis suggests that 20% of people in China may face famine by 2050. It's a concerning number, 20%. But let's take just a moment for perspective. It's not a majority. It's a possibility there in 20% for meaningful aid, for meaningful assistance. It means it doesn't have to be a catastrophe, that there's an edge of hope if we can work together. And China is not the nation of most concern as we get into Asia. Let's talk for a moment about Southeast Asia. There are many beautiful places in Southeast Asia that are extremely high risk in our changing world. Think of the great island nations, the Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia. Not only are they facing increases in heat and water patterns that are much more serious than we face in America, many of the people in these nations have lives that are tied to the sea. And the changes to the ocean are more dramatic and scary than the changes to the land. These are serious things we're talking about here. They're worth talking about calmly. None of us choose where we're going to be born. Many of these beautiful, culturally rich, very sophisticated nations in Southeast Asia, they are the most vulnerable, most densely populated areas on our planet. There's widespread agreement. Globally, there's going to be a need for people to move, and not everyone will be able to. What can I do but say it clearly? People are going to die. That is the message you see on the news, right? It's climate, everyone's going to die. On my channel, I try to give you a local news. In America, we're enormously fortunate. Our local outlook is much better than the world outlook. We have a chance. And that chance, I mean, look at our hand and look at the other cards on the table. We got bets we need to take. We need to get ready here in the US. Here, we've got a great chance to live not just scrabbly lives, but humane lives. The kind of lives we want here on Earth. And we've got a chance to help others as well. Right now, I talk with people across the professional field. They say people are moving both globally and within the US. Right now, people with money and knowledge are moving, but the knowledge, it's not broadly or fairly distributed. That's where I'm trying to help. Because right now, it's easier for people to get out than it will be. We must spread this knowledge so that people who are listening can hear the warning. Those of us who can get to areas with the potential for hope, we have to work together to build that hope. We have to work to fully realize it. We need to make agricultural changes so that America can remain a food exporter. We need to make infrastructure changes so that we can welcome just as many people as we can. It can't be everyone because every place has a carrying capacity. A lot of places with hope, their hope rests on sustainable use of groundwater, and that's just not an infinite resource. Finding out how many people we can safely welcome and building that community, that's a great human challenge ahead. Looking at 2050 from within the U.S., there is substantial hope, great hope, if we share knowledge now aggressively, it seems not impossible that we could continue to feed and house all Americans. But there's, of course, a great world beyond our borders. The most populous parts of the world are amongst the most vulnerable, the places with the least realistic hope. There are many concerns that one of the early tipping points we might hit would shut down the monsoon over India. That would be a horror of such magnitude we, we haven't seen it. The more we prepare in those regions where there is hope, the more we can save. So where is there hope? Where could we take people in? Identify where your country is in these broad climactic zones and then look at your water situation. Look for temperate areas with groundwater resources and with sustainable water cultures and practices. These are the places around the world where we can make a stand. So spread the word because in this world there is hope 
and we can prepare for what's coming. When I say let's get ready, it's not just for those of us who are so lucky we were born in a place where we can look forward to a future that still includes so many things we love about our lives and communities today. I say let's get ready because we lucky ones, we need to have enough to be able to give. Let's get ready and come through these changes not just human, but humane, as decent and moral as we can. When we talk about these things, and they are terrifying things, we often talk about them just in terms of the science. But we cannot have an effective response without our human values of justice and mercy and kindness. When we prepare today, our hope can be brightest when these are at the center. You have a part in this. Let's get ready.